for this evening, Lord. We thank you that we can open our Bibles to Second Timothy. And we, again, just invite you to come speak to us in a mighty and powerful way. Lord, I believe your word is alive and living. And um, I believe you want to speak to each and every one of us tonight. And in these days in which we live, Lord, are, are not only interesting days, but they're perilous times. And um, we see these things happening before our eyes. And so, Lord, I pray that you would wake us up, wake up our hearts and our minds, and, and that we would leave here transformed, renewed, because we've come before you, Lord, and you've spoken to our hearts. And so if there's anything that needs to change in our lives, if there's anything that needs to change in our hearts, if there's anything we need to repent of, Lord, we pray for your conviction, Lord, for, um, for you to, um, to turn us back to you, Lord. And uh, we just lift up these scriptures, Lord, um, that, that they would speak directly to each and every one of us. And so we thank you for this time and this study. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, well, at our Second Timothy chapter 4, we'll start there. And, um, let's see. you know, Paul, if you remember in Second Timothy, he was, he, this is his second letter, of course. They say it was written around 67, or 66 to 67 A.D., and if you remember, we actually have a slide. Do you guys want to do one of the slides? Paul was writing um, while he was in prison, in the maritime prison. This is the actual prison here. Um, you can visit it today. It was the maritime prison in Rome, and he was being held there in chains. You know, in Act, we're studying Acts. You know, this is a different prison <laughs> that Paul was in. Paul was in Caesarea in Jerusalem, in Israel, in Caesarea. Um, in the prison in Acts. So this is when he made it to Rome. <clears throat> and Second Timothy um, was written to Timothy, the young pastor, and these are Paul's last words. His last words, and they were written just days before he was led out to, uh, of, the, of the city and before he was beheaded. And so now the Bible doesn't uh, tell us how Paul was killed, but however, in the Fox of Book of Martyrs, um, it tells us this. It says, Paul the Apostle, who before was called Saul, after his great travail and unspeakable labors in promoting the gospel of Christ, suffered also in this first persecution under Nero. They, coming to Paul, instructing the people, desired him to pray for them that they might believe, who told them that shortly after they should believe and be baptized. This done, the soldiers came and led him out of the city to the place of execution where he, after his prayers made, gave his neck to the sword. And so I've said this before, you know, a person's last words are important, right? And Paul seems to understand that this, this is, you know, it, the, the final solemn charge to Timothy, um, who he loved. And, you know, it, not only did Paul love him, but you know, he just understood the ex significance, I guess, of, of this letter. And so when Timothy would read um, Paul's charge, I think he would have understood the seriousness, the seriousness of these final instructions. And so let's see what Paul has for Timothy here in verse 1 of chapter 4. It says, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Guys, there will be a day when every single human is going to stand before Christ. Jew and Gentile, unsaved and saved. Every human will stand, believer, unbeliever, right, is going to stand before Jesus. I mean, you know, and, and, and you know, people think, in our day and age, people think they're getting away with sin, right? The people, you know, and, and, and yet they'll have to be accountable one day. And they'll have to stand before Jesus. Now, as believers, we also get to stand before Jesus, but it's, it's going to be the bema seat of Christ where we're going to 
it not be judged because we have Jesus, right? He took on our penalty. We're going to get rewards for the things we've done for him. And so, you know, that's going to be awesome. <laughs> but every single human will stand before Christ. Now, look at verse 2. It says, and I'm going to go back to verse 1. But just real quickly, verse 2, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Now going back to verse 1, 2, it says, I charge you. I charge you. The word charge can be mean like official commission. I'm commissioning. You know, I charge you what? To preach the word. Timothy, I charge you to preach the word. It, it's like when, when someone says, I charge you, it's like getting orders from your boss. I need you to do this, right? These are the instructions. And so this, is, this means Timothy was, was, you know, these were his instructions from Paul. And, um, and these orders came directly from God, essentially, not just from Paul. You know, I was thinking about that. What is our job as Christians? Our job as Christians is, verse 2, preach the word. To preach the word. And um, to everyone, we're to preach the word, right? Guys, this is the, the interesting, the seventh time in this small little letter, four little chapters, right, that Paul tells us, gives us this emphasis of the word of God. The seventh time. The word of God is so, so important. And guys, the word of God is what ministry is all about. The word of God, the scriptures. It's what counseling is about. It's what one-on-one -on -one evangelism is about. It's the word, the word, the word, the word. You know, it's what being a true friend, you know, it, it, you know, preaching. The word preaching means heralding or declaring, right? Declaring the word of God. <laughs> The word, there's no substitute in church except the Bible. I mean, it's just the Bible. And only the Bible changes lives forever. The word of God, God's word changes lives forever. And, you know, before getting into the, the, the direct context of, of the, you know, really the individual job of the pastor in, in the church, um, I, I think it's so important that I, I just emphasize what ministry, what church should be about. The Word of God. <laughs> I mean, it sounds so simple, <laughs> you know, as we read this, the Word, but, you know, every church should be about this one thing, God's Word. Every church. And yet, unfortunately, I hate to say it, but too many ministries and churches in our culture, Northwest included, preach everything except the word it just it is it's happened it's happening and and i i say this not to criticize not to look down upon but just to be clear what god's word actually says about the word it's i mean i i was thinking how many churches i i i, I wonder i don't know the answer but how many churches actually teach the word I mean, how many churches are actually teaching the word and and, and I'm not saying just not preaching about the Bible, you know, because some, you know, some do that or, you know, topics about the Bible, you know. Um, and, and not to say we can't do that, you know, but, but too many in our day and age it, it teach about self-improvement or how to have a better marriage or 40 days to, you know, learn about this or that or, you know, to accomplish great things or something, right? And, and, and we've had too much of that in our world. You know, they say right now in the, in the United States of America, there's 1,300 megachurches in the United States. And what they deem a megachurch is 2,000 people in attendance each week. So if you have 2,000 people each week, you're considered a megachurch. And so um, of, out of this number, 50 of them are Calvary Chapels. <laughs> 50 of them, around 50, I think. I didn't know the exact number, but, and I think that's good news because Calvary Chapel, we teach systematically, verse by verse through the Bible, through books of the Bible, and, and, and the whole counsel of God's word is what we try to do. And, 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 you know, I'm not saying other churches don't do that. I know there's other churches that teach the Bible, 
You know, there's other, it's not just Calvary Chapels. There's other churches that teach the Bible, but the overwhelming majority of those, of those uh, 1,300 churches, the majority of them, are either what we would categorize as seeker-sensitive churches or even false teaching churches, the, the majority of them, right? Um, I have a, a friend that um, Lisa and I, we ran into the, the, them at Costco, and, and he goes to kind of a, um, I would call it maybe a seeker-friendly church, and we asked them about a month ago, how, how's church? And they said, ah, we kind of stopped going to church. Like, really? And Lisa was, Lisa was sharing most of it. She's like, it's all about the word. You need the word. And they're like, eh. You know? <laughs> and, I mean, this is a guy that I've known, I was in ministry with, and, you know, was in ministry. You know, this, this couple. And, and it just, it saddened our heart. We prayed for them, you know, and we loved them and stuff. But it just, if you guys, listen, if you're not grounded in the word, if, if it's anything else other than the word, it's easy to get off track. You know, it's easy to get off track. Now, with that in mind, verse 2 is really about the individual pastor because it says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. So it first tells us to be prepared in season or out of season. Um, I think this means that we need to be ready, right? We have to be ready. We have to be ready to teach God's word. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, wonderful as a pastor, as a Bible teacher, to have a lot of time to prepare to study. It's important to do that. It's important to take time to study God's word. You know, we, you need that. You just, you know, to study for tonight. It takes time, and I'm certainly grateful when I have time to study God's word. I know when I worked another job, it was a lot harder, you know, to do that. Because, you know, you'd kind of put on the one hat and, and, and then put on another hat and, and then study, and, and it, it's harder to do that. And, and I think I was, I was so grateful when I was able to come on staff because, you know, to come on full-time because it, my focus is a lot better, you know. It blesses the church when, 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 you, when as a pastor, I can be here because my focus is... Is, is on this one thing, you know, teaching God's word and, and being a pastor here. But, but I think this, 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 you know, be ready in season, out of season, it indicates that the pastor is, has to be ready. <laughs> and, and if you're ready, that means you have to be studying. You have to be about God's word, and that requires time. I know I've told uh, Pastor John and Pastor Nathan right there, you know, I tell them sometimes, I probably need to tell them, I'm going to tell them right now, just like, you know, be ready in case I have to, <laughs> I'm not be able to be here, you know. If or I'm sick or something, you know, have a message ready. You know, there's something that God's putting you, prepare that. You know, it's, it's important to do that. And, and, and as pastors, sometimes we have to do this without notice. We have to be ready to teach God's word. And, you know, the same principle, though less accountability, applies to every believer. Right? It applies to, to all of us. Right? You know, if, if a family member you've been praying for asks you a question, I mean, isn't it good to be ready to answer that question? You know, to, you know they, they ask you something about the Bible. They ask you something about Jesus. You know, I think the question, are you prepared to give an answer? Are you prepared to give an answer? And it, you know, and it's okay if we don't know. Sometimes, you know, I, people ask me questions all the time, and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't, and, and maybe there's not an answer for it, but, but we have, you know, and if you don't know, then go and find out. You know, do some research, and we have so many um, resources at our fingertips these days, free resources, you know, that, that you can find um, the answers to that. I know um, Don Stewart is on his channel, and he has a ministry called Educating Our World. And he is a, he is a sharp guy. I mean, smart, one of the smartest guys I've ever met. And um, he, all, I've noticed all of his books are free. And if you want to know anything about Bible prophecy is kind of one of his things. Um, 
you can go online and, and, and read those things. And um, I like Charlie Campbell, the, we mentioned it, I think, last week, the Always, Always Be Ready um, website and, you know, the Blue Letter Bible. You can, you can just hover over words and it'll tell you the Greek and Hebrew for it, you know. And there's a, there's a free Bible app called um, the Word.net. And I think you can get like Pastor Chuck's notes and all these things. We have so much, you know, to just go through. And, and so um, it should be our goal to find the answer, to, to study those things. And, and, and I think personally, like if, if you've been going to church for even, you know, six months, you should be able to answer some questions. I, I truly believe that. You should be able to to answer questions if someone asks you and, and enough with people um, to, to correct them or rebuke or encourage, you know, or say, you know, well, that's not really in the Bible. Or, or you can say, you know, I don't think that's in the Bible. I'll, let me take a look at it, right? And so that's, see, these are the results of, of Bible preaching and teaching. You, you learn the Bible. You know the Bible, Right? Um, the first thing here it says, preach the word, be read in season, out of season, convince. Some versions say correct. You could actually trans substitute the word convict here. That's the result of reading the Bible. You're convicted, right? My pastor used to always say, you don't have to read very far before you're convicted, right? You, do, you don't have to read very far before you're convicted, I, I need to change. There's the, the, I'm not doing this, this thing. And, and, um, and so, you know, in Hebrews 4.12, it says, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two double-edged sword. Uh, it penetrates even the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And that's why there's times when you feel like God is sitting next to you <laughs> in the chair next to you during a Bible study. And he's speaking to your heart. Right? He's speaking right to you. Um, God's spirit works through God's word. If God's word's being taught, God's spirit works through that. And, and, and he'll call us to convince or, re, or correction, conviction. He'll call us to that. He'll convict us. And that tugging you feel at times is just simply God saying, you know what? I want you to make some changes. I want you to, I want you to, and you know, part of church is we, we come here and we hear God's word and we worship. The, the Lord wants us to respond, right? He wants us to, re, when we read God's word, he wants us to respond. And too often we're like, oh, that, that's great. It sounds great. I agree. But we, if we're not doing anything about it, it's, we're not doing ourselves any good. We have to make some changes. And, and he's saying, you're, you're living this way, and I want you to go another direction. I want you to do something different. And, and he wants to exchange our sinful lifestyle, right, for a righteous lifestyle. You know, to, to make it simpler. And, if you, and it, he wants you to make a course correction. Right? That's why we need the Bible. Otherwise, we don't know what course that is. And, and so he speaks to us in that way. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't happen if the pastor's only telling funny stories, right? Or, or motivating, you know, you with inspirational tales or whatever. You know, listen, it's okay to tell a funny story. I do it sometimes, you know. But the main focus has to be God's word. It has to be the word of God. You know, it, it, it's, 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 you know, again, the main focus is not entertainment. Though, when you're entertained, it's mem memorable. You'll, you'll remember it, you know. Um, but there's no conviction unless it's the Word of God. Right? You're not convinced unless it's the Word of God. And so, you know, it's great to have, you know, a theater production, a choir, these things. But, 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 but. The conviction happens when God's word is being taught, okay? God's word. The second thing, look at, it says rebuke. Verse 2. Rebuke, an open rebuke 
you know, often can be when God's word is being taught. You know, an, an unrepentant sinner is sitting in church and, and, and the Bible's being taught. And it, think of it this way. It's like God warning you. You better stop what you're doing. It's a warning. A rebuke is a warning. Stop what you're doing right now. Um, you know, it, it's not unusual, I think, sometimes when people are warned. You know, and I know sometimes as a pastor, I have to warn people. And it's not an easy thing to do. To tell someone, you know, you, I need you to be careful here. Or this, you're going down the wrong road. Or, you know, how, you know say it in love. But when you, when you call out someone, um, it, you know, oftentimes what happens is when we, it's not unusual for people when they're rebuked from God's word, okay? They leave the church, you know? They leave because they get uncomfortable <laughs> because they don't want to change right? And I'm not saying everybody who leaves the church is, you know, has that, but there's an old saying, I think Pastor Chuck used to say that, he said, um, as about pastors, a pastor should comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> I like that. Comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> you know, that's, in, in a sense, that's the role of the Bible, right? Conviction. Rebuke. And so, you know, I know we've had people sit here for a while and, you know, and then they find some imaginary fault or something and, and then they just go on to another church because they don't, they want to sit in the back and they want to, they want to, they don't want to, they don't want to, you know, be convicted. You know, they, they want, they want something else and, and um, because it comes down to this, we have to be really careful that we are not refusing to change. But that's what happens sometimes. We just, we refuse to change. This is the way I am and this is the way it's going to be, you know, and we refuse. And so, guys, again, it's hard to hear God's word week after week if you're not going to respond. That's the whole point. God wants us to respond to his word, right? And so it's a warning to all of us. It's a warning to, to, to us all. It's our job to respond to, to the word of God with our, and so you have a choice. You can either repent or leave. And that's what, sometimes we do that, right? We just, we, we just leave. We, I don't even want to deal with this. Now, the, the third thing here is exhort. Um, you know, I think good Bible teaching exhorts people, or we might even say encourages those who are willing to respond. And so... You know, when someone, I think, falls under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, the devil is always there to try to guilt them, right? And I think the Bible teacher, is it's important that we encourage people who are, who are following after God, right? Who are serving the Lord, who are, who are continuing in their faith. That's what he wants. You know, the Bible never leaves us hanging, Right? It, it convicts us, but then it, it builds us up, doesn't it? It, it encourages us. I mean, you, you also can't read the Bible too long without an encouraging word. And, and it does that time and time again. The minute when we, we repent, encouragement is right, right there. It, have you found that? The minute you repent, the you feel so good. The, it, the weight is lifted off your shoulders. You're, you're encouraged in the Lord. And finally here, Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. You know, um, some versions say patience, long suffering. When you suffer long, it, you are patient. And, you know, here's what I would say. You know, it, for some people, it takes longer to get there than others. And sometimes it takes people a while. Have you ever noticed that? Just, I mean, some people, it just, it seems like their life doesn't change very quickly. And I think, you know, and, and then fin finally they get it one day. they just like, I get it. This makes sense. And, and it's where the Holy Spirit is meeting their heart. And um, I just can't imagine if, if we would have given up on them, right? Let's kick them out of church or <laughs> whatever it is. Because, you know, they're, they're troublemakers or whatever. But, you know, one, I know one thing we've tried to do here over the years, is just love people 
sometimes that are hard to love, right? Love people to the end until they decide they're going to move on to somewhere else or they're, they're going to go somewhere else. I, I want people to look back and say, you know what? At Calvary Chapel, they loved us and they taught the word of God. I want them to say that. And they taught the word and they loved us. I hope people say that about us. Um, many people, I think, quit too soon, though. And you know what? I've, I've known people, they've, they've quit the ministry, they've quit, you know, church, or they've quit stuff, and, and they missed out on such a great work of God. You know, the great things that God was doing and all the things that God has done. You know, if you've been here a while, you've seen God do great and mighty things in our fellowship. And, and that's so good to be part of that. And, and, and so God, I think he wants us to get it right away. I really do. But, but I also, I know this about the Lord. He hangs in there with us until we finally do, right? Because it takes some of us a little longer to figure it out. Um, so we just, I think the, the encouragement is we just keep instructing people and we keep encouraging people, right? Um, we challenge them to, to serve, to be part, to, 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 you know, to be part of church and, and so on and so forth. But the point of all of that is it's the word of God that changes lives, right? And um, it's not support groups, not to say they don't help. It's not even counseling techniques. It's, you know, it, it's, it's, it's the word of God that changes lives, right? So that according to Paul, with that in kind of mind, according to Paul, this is the time we live in. Look at verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Here's what Pastor Chuck said on this very verse. He says, Paul prophesied of a day when audiences would insist on only hearing teaching that's easy to listen to, teaching that only tells them what they want to hear. This is a graphic description of a seeker-friendly movement within the church today. Entertain the people, tell them what they want to hear. It's like cotton candy, sweet to the taste, but without substance. Guys, Paul is warning us of the day that we live in right now. He says, for a time will come. A time will come for what? When they will not endure sound doctrine. Sound, it means healthy, good, right? Teaching. That's what it means. You know, doctrine, you know, the instruction. It, you know, it tells us that they will not endure it. They will not um, uphold to it. You know, they will not sustain it. They, will, they want nothing to do with it. We are in those times. We're in those times. I'm afraid. Now, I want to say this too, because I, I think that some pastors use this as an excuse to preach dry, boring messages and put people to sleep. What do they say? They say, you know what? They complain that their people are not enduring sound doctrine. I'm serious, though. You know, but Paul, listen, he's talking about the content of the teaching, not the way it's being presented. Right? Healthy doctrine, correct doctrine, you know, teaching of the, the, the orthodox truths of Christianity, it can be done in a way to make, you know, make people, you know, I, I, the Bible it comes alive, right? I mean, that's the job of the pastor, to make the Bible come alive and not put, people to sleep or endure torture, right? <laughs> um, and so Paul, he's not talking about enduring poorly done teaching. But that a day is going to come when people will not want to listen to any kind of healthy teaching. Do you see the difference? It says in verse 3, according, in the middle part, according to their own desires, because they have itching ears. Their desires, their cravings, their longings. You know, they, you know, they, they have an itch. They want to get, they want to get scratched. It's like the teacher is going to tell them 
what they want to hear to make them feel better about their sins, about their lusts, right? About their, their, their you know, t- tell me that my sinful lifestyle is not, gonna, not a big deal. That's what they want to hear. And we have that, <laughs> without going into detail, okay? We have that. We have that right in, you know, in our society right now. You know, don't tell me I'm a sinner. Don't tell me how my lifestyle's wrong, right? All these things. And so, and, you know, they say many churches today, they start, they've started in, in the last 10, 20 years or so, started, have started off by, they survey people, what do you want in a church? And what, of course, what are people going to say? Well, don't tell me that I'm wrong. Don't tell, you know, don't tell me, you know, I'm living Im- immorally. Don't tell me, don't talk about sin. Don't talk about hell. Just tell me how great I am. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, it, you know, it's, we, want it, we want people to tell us how great we are, you know. And, and so um, they think church should be about making them feel good, right? And so that's what these churches have given them. Um, the biggest church in the United States, is, as far as my calculations, um, is in Houston, Texas. And they have perfected this very thing. They have more than, now before COVID and all this stuff, 30,000 people attend each week. 30,000. Right? Guys, the last days. The, the church doesn't talk about sin. You know, I mean, it's all documented. <laughs> Look it up for yourself. Right? Hell. So, the last days are here. The last days are here. And God has an answer to these churches. Look at verse 5. He tells us, But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Paul reminds Timothy, no, no matter what any of the other pastors are doing, right? What, what, no matter what all the other churches are doing, I want you to stay focused on what God has for you. And he says, you know, remember earlier in this book, Paul said, uh, you're, a, you're a soldier, Timothy. You're a soldier. Why? Because Timothy was going to have to endure hardship. You know, um, in, the, in the King James Version, it says afflictions that, that Timothy was, Timothy was going to have to go through, you know, in, in ministry. And I don't think this is something any, any of us want. We don't want hardship, afflictions. But, 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 you know, I think it tells us here, and a pastor has to endure some hardship. You know, a pastor can't be looking to get famous or have some kind of easy lifestyle or, you know, so on and so forth, you know. Um, Timothy was to work hard and, and understand that things are going to be kind of tough. The ministry is going to be tough. And, and, and Paul tells him, hang in there, stay focused on what God has for you. But as you know, it's not just for pastors <laughs> to endure hardship. It's for all Christians. It's hard to say that. Isn't it? It's hard to kind of accept that, isn't it? But it's for all Christians. Everybody who wants to, desires to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted as the last chapter told us, right? Paul tells Timothy, okay, stay focused. Do the work of an evangelist. Every pastor, and I would argue every Christian, is assigned to this work. Every Christian, every pastor is assigned to this work. Timothy, remember he was we learn he was timid. Uh, he, he was a young man, and yet God told him, do the work of an evangelist. Now, he didn't say Timothy was a gifted evangelist. As a matter of fact, you know, well, he, but he didn't say he was gifted, but he says, I want you to do this work anyways, you know, in your own way. And, and um, guys, all ministry, all ministry this is, you know, winning souls is kind of the core, right? I, I mean, that, that's why we come and we get fed. We, we, we learn God's word so we can go out into this world and we can share. We can share the gospel. You know, every ministry here at Calvary Chapel, we, 
um, is designed to, to point people to Jesus. We want that. Now, I think too often what churches have done is they, they've lowered the bar down here when we should be raising the bar up here. You know, you can go to some churches, and it's all about evangelism. It's never not about evangelism, you know, and so the, you know, people never learn God's word. Right? But if we learn God's word, then we want and desire to go out and do it, I, I think. But, you know, one of the, the, um, the, the vision that we have here at Calvary Chapel is, the, you know, the gospel, Jesus, the word of God is at the core. And, you know, we have it on the wall over there by the fireplace. It's simply Jesus, you know, all, all for Jesus, all about Jesus, all through Jesus. And there's, you know, we've run ministries that we, we've had here um, uh, through through that vision, and, and we've said, well, if it doesn't fit, if it's not about Jesus, if it's not about the gospel, then we, then then you know we've had something. We don't want to do it. You know, we don't want to do it. Um, and you know, because guys, we have no other purpose. It's got to be about Jesus. It's got to be about the gospel. It's got to be about God's word, the living word. It's interesting. We have no record of Timothy ever leading a revival. We actually have no record uh, of him even preaching. He was just Paul's helper. He just helped Paul. And yet, these are the words that Paul is sharing with Timothy. And then Paul is reminding him, again, to do the work of evangelist. And, and I think that's really my prayer tonight you know as we as we shared earlier we live in a in a evil wicked world we truly do and there's so much there's you know there's so much filth that we don't even want to know about right i mean if we really saw what was going on it would we i mean it would be gross right in this world um and and yet I think a prayer that we should pray is that God would give us a heart for lost people. Because I think that the longer we walk with the Lord and we see the, we see the, the filth in this world, we just have to remember that the Lord loves them. You know, he loves them. And, and I think we also need to pray that we'll have a willingness to speak up about Jesus, Right? Let's, let's pray that. Lord, we do come before you, and I just am reminded this evening just how important your word is, Lord, how much we need your word, Lord, and how your word speaks to each and every one of our hearts, Lord. And I would say most people in this room have want the word to speak to us, Lord. We want it to convict us. We want to walk with you, Lord, and and we don't always, Lord. We, we, we sometimes go our own way, and yet I, we know that the word corrects us. It puts us right on the right path. And Lord, many of us have walked with you for a long time, and, and yet we understand that you want none to perish, Lord, that, that, that we want to take and heed these words that you gave Paul to Timothy to, to do the work of evangelists, Lord. And yet, if we're realistic about that, we understand the difficulty of that and the, and the hardship of that. And we understand that it, we, we know you love lost people, Lord. And, and I think we do to a certain extent too. We, we certainly want people to come to know you, Lord, um, because we know we have the answers for life. And yet too often, Father, we don't always have the willingness, willingness to speak up about you, Jesus, because we... You know, it's hard. It's difficult. Because we, we, most of the time, people don't want to hear it. And yet, Lord, I believe you've called all Christians to share your love, to share your truth, to share your truth in love, Lord. And I would pray that you might give us a boldness in these last days, in these days in which we live, even that person whom we would think there's no way... <laughs> that they've never come to know you, Lord. I pray that you might open up doors and divine appointments and opportunities for us to share. And th those people that we've been praying for, those family and friends that we've been praying for for so long, we pray that we'd have opportunities to, 
to um, to share your love, your truth with them. And we just pray, Father, that you would guide us because we need that that we need a fresh feeling of your Holy Spirit. We can't do it in our own strength, Lord. We need your strength. We need we need we need the filling of your Holy Spirit in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds, Lord, to, to be able to go out into this world, Lord, because this world is scary. Lord, this world is, is frightening, and this world is fearful. And so I pray, Lord, that we don't have the spirit of fear, though. You've given us faith, Lord, and you've given us strength. And so I pray, Lord, that you would fill us up and give us divine appointments. But as we also, Lord, just read your word. I pray that you would convict us, Lord, that, you, that we would receive the rebuke, that we would receive um, the exhortations, the encouragement that we need to get through this time in which we live. So I pray for each and every person here, Lord. I ask you to bless them, keep them safe as we travel our own separate ways, and um, be with us, Lord, as a church, as Christians, as a community, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you would be doing a mighty, mighty work, Lord. We pray for revival. We pray that people would, would come to know you, Lord, um, and that you would be doing a work in our hearts to start. But um, may you just pour out your spirit upon the schedule. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Any thoughts, last thoughts or questions?